I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. Before I get into my uh, official talk, I'd like to just make a comment on language and more broadly, any sort of prompt that draws us into a, a beneficial state of being, which in turn we can internalize to grow beneficial traits hardwired into our own body. And you may have heard that at the end of the meditation or technically as we began the break, I used the phrases or the words undisturbed, undivided, and undefended. Now, some might say that it's problematic to put the word un in the front because, you know, somehow then what you're thinking about is being defended, divided, and disturbed. And that might be true. Uh, on the other hand, the brain is pretty good at, it's called chunking, taking multiple parts and whoop, forming them into a whole. And if words like undefended or unthreatened um, uh, work for you, as they do for me, that's good. But most importantly, of course, find languaging and, and nonverbal cues or prompts or nudges that, that work really well for you. I was just kind of thinking as I was getting ready to comment here that the word unhappy <laughs> has that word un in it. And she might think that saying, you know, that I'm unhappy is going to make you really happy because it foregrounds happy, but actually we, we notice that it doesn't. Of course, maybe that's the negativity bias at work. Anyway, find, find your own words. Um, and obviously there are times in practical reality when we need to be defended or understandably we are um, disturbed by something, including sorrow at injustice on others. Uh, and we may well be divided inside, you know, inner conflict, different parts of us. One, one part of us um, knows we really ought to do one thing. 99% uh, of it though, 99% of us is going in another direction. It's okay, it's normal. On the other hand, as we come to rest, as we return home, since the resting state of a system, its equilibrium state most defines it, it is its home. So when we come to rest, deeply at rest, biologically and psychologically, we rest in a mood, generally, of peacefulness, contentment, and love. That's really good news. And as we come to rest as well, we notice that we're, we are actually undisturbed. We actually are whole and undivided. And in this resting state, we're not fighting with anything. In a sense, we're wide open and thus undefended. So you, might, you might use these as a way of drawing yourself home. Uh, okay. So I'd like to talk about um, a fundamental topic in Buddhism that I misunderstood for many years. And I misunderstood it for a reason having to do with mistranslations of key terms that are routinely used in Western Buddhism, perhaps in the East as well. And I'd like to talk through this, not to be pedantic, but actually as an invitation into a deep, deep freedom in relationship to the conditions of reality. So let me, let's go on a, let's go on a journey together. So, First of all, under the heading of is life suffering, consider whatever you might call suffering. Headache, your children leaving home, someone being mean to you, stirring up wounded feelings, a snarky comment. Um, I did a good piece of work that I put out into the world yesterday, midday, and it's been 30 hours and no one has responded. What? 
right? Uh, or just overwhelming physical pain, you know, um, bone cancer or emotional anguish, the shocking loss of a loved one. So making it real for yourself, what's your suffering? What you might call suffering. Maybe it's a kind of a quiet sense of unhappiness or anxiety, depressed mood. Um, maybe you're worried about someone you really care about, worried about your government, the state of the world. Just what for you is what you might call, you know, suffering, unhappiness, sorrow, stress, tension, dis-ease, unease, anger, shame, inadequacy, feeling unloved, feeling that there's an, in, an injustice, maybe in some of your key relationships, I relate to that, in which, to put it kind of bluntly, you really are not getting the recognition you deserve, the respect, the gratitude, the understanding, the empathy that you do deserve. Okay? So first, what is suffering? What is it? <laughs> Fundamentally, it's an experience. Right? As far as we know, rocks do not suffer. Corn, as far as we know, does not suffer. Uh, amoeba. Uh, uh, creatures without a nervous system do not seem to suffer. Suffering is an experience. And as the Buddha taught, um, experiences are made up of parts that are connected and changing. So that's what it is. Um, it's an experience. And we could say it's an experience that we don't prefer. We, w we don't wish it on others. We don't wish for it ourselves. And we could say that as all experiences, it has the nature of what's called emptiness in the sense that it consists of parts that are connected and changing and dependent upon various causes to come into being and to pass away. That's what it is. Okay. Now, our topic here, why do we suffer? Why is there suffering? What's the why? This was fundamental interest of the Buddha because he, his great preoccupation after he left home and abandoned his, his um, wife and young child and it went forth into homelessness, as they say, he was preoccupied with why are we not rested all the time in the highest happiness? Why do we suffer? And he explored one increasingly subtle answer after another until he came to his complete, irrevocable, permanent, lasting realization about why we suffer and thus what we can do about it. Now, the why we suffer, which he fully recognized, the Buddha, um, involves causes at multiple levels, and they interact with each other. We have environmental factors like hurricanes, flat tires, events. We have societal factors, including structural factors, the economy, culture, racism, um, just the way the government works. We have interpersonal causes of suffering, just how people treat us, the neighbors, the lovers, <laughs> the person next to, to you in your bed at night, it's interpersonal causes of suffering. And then, where he especially focused, was on psychological or mental causes of suffering, causes inside our own minds. So, and as we increasingly understand it, these mental causes of suffering are grounded in um, our own biology. And before we go any further, I just want to say that non-human animals suffer. Lizards suffer. Cats, dogs, maybe mosquitoes suffer. In some way, I don't know, uh, maybe corn suffers, maybe rocks suffer, I don't know. But I think we can certainly settle in that suffering is an experience that uh, requires a nervous system, 
certainly in the most obvious and immediate cases, including ourselves. So in this context then, the Buddha focused on psychological and mental causes of suffering. That was his focus. That these causes are the locus of our experiences. Our experiences are mental phenomena, they're psychological phenomena. And our experiences are the membrane or buffer between the experiencing being, a cat, a lizard, a human, and overall material reality. So we're focusing on experiences. Now today, 2,500 years ago, 2,500 years later, we've learned a lot about how the mental, psychological level is interdependent with the biological level. And that has real implications, some of which I'll be getting to real soon. So as you probably know, the Buddha offered an answer to the question of why do we suffer in the form of the four noble, or it could be said, ennobling truths in that um, these are truths that what is noble within us, what is worthy and wholesome and, and um, sacred even within us is drawn to, and we are ennobled along the way in our engagement with these truths. So I'm going to use the original language of Pali, of the language of the earliest surviving primary written record of Buddhism and um, the language of the Buddha at the time. And um, because a key point here is that some of these terms, especially the first one, have been translated in very problematic ways. So as a summary of his answer to the question of why do we suffer, why is there suffering, and what can we do about it, we have the facts, the truths of, in Pali, dukkha, tanha, narodha, and maga, commonly translated as there is suffering, its cause is craving, craving and suffering can cease, and there is a path toward the cessation of craving and suffering. So we have, um, in the metaphor that's commonly used of the Buddha as a physician, we have a description of what ails us, dukkha. We have a diagnosis of the cause of that illness, tanha. We have the result of treatment, nirodha, cessation, and we have a um, prescription, the Eightfold Path. Okay? Pretty familiar Buddhism. I'd like to focus here on the first two of these, dukkha and tanha. Dukkha, commonly translated as suffering. Suffering. The noble truth of suffering. Routinely you hear, you know, there is suff you know, the first noble truth is suffering. Sometimes uh, stated very pervasively, life is suffering, everything is suffering. Wow, is that really true? Personally, as I encountered Buddhism, you know, I initially in um, my, you know, very early 20s, 1974, uh, and then much later, again, um, th starting 30 years ago or so in the West, uh, routinely, I would just kind of ask myself, wait a minute here, is everything suffering? Like what? Or more precisely, is all human experience suffering at its core? What? Like how could that be, actually? So you yourself may already have been ahead of where I was, and I'm kind of sharing with you some some real recent learnings and clarities. Things have come together for me. Uh, so if you've been ahead, <laughs> you know, I, I w I'm glad for you. <laughs> uh, I'm catching up. So what is dukkha? Dukkha, dukkha. You may know that the root of the words, the roots for the word dukkha in Pali, shared with Sanskrit, du means wonky, not good, eh, problematic suboptimal, duh. And then ka 
is the meeting of an, an of an axle with a wheel. Imagine a wooden ox cart 2,500 years ago, the meeting of the, of the axle with the hub of the wheel, dukkha. And, uh, you know, one way to think of it is sort of a wobbly grinding as a condition, as an attribute of reality, of, of, of reality. So dukkha is not suffering per se. This is really key. The Buddha identified three kinds of dukkha. These are conditions in reality. And we can look in our own experience and go, yeah, there is dukkha. <laughs> There's a lot of it. Uh, first kind is physical and emotional pain. Now, we might say that pain equals suffering, and yet there's a very important distinction between pain and suffering that I'll get to. But certainly, you drop a brick on your foot, there is pain. Uh, you know, someone you care about gets really bad news from their doctor, there is emotional pain. There is that kind of dukkha. All right. And there are two other kinds that are really, really important. The second kind of dukkha is the ending of what we like, what we enjoy, what we find pleasurable, what is important to us, the ending of what we like. And because anicca, which is Pali for impermanence, is a pervasive characteristic of just about all phenomena, I'm not sure that the speed of light in the Big Bang universe is anicca, but Maybe, who knows? So yes, you know, good things come to an end. That's a condition. And yet, as I'll speak about in a moment, is that inherently suffering? Because as the pleasant ends, more pleasant can arise alongside a particular enjoyable thing that is ending, could be certainly many other things that are ongoing and pleasurable and enjoyable and continuing. Um, our relationship to the endless endings of that which we like can affect whether we suffer as a result. And even if the endless endings of conditioned phenomena are happening, they are matched by an endless arising. And the endless endings of Phenomena enables the ending of things we don't like. It's not inherently suffering at all. It's just the way it is. Things end, including things we like. Okay, what are we going to do about that? And then a third kind of dukkha, identified by the Buddha in classic teachings, is the inherent instability, the dynamism of all phenomena. It's made of parts that are connected and changing. It's it's fizzing, it's foamy, it's, it lacks ultimate solidity and self-causing permanence. It arises and passes away dependently. The universe, reality, is a field of relations. Okay. That's routinely described by, in the text, in, by, by teachers, as somehow... Um, and unsatisfactory or alarming. It's not inherently unsatisfactory that the universe is more like a cloud than a brick, that all phenomena in the universe are cloud-like, even ones that weigh 100 pounds. That's not inherently unsatisfactory. That's not inherently alarming. It's not inherently suffering. It is said that Enjoyable phenomena are unsatisfactory because they end. Is that really true? Are they inherently unsatisfactory? Because is the meal you're enjoying, is the show, the movie that you're watching, inherently unsatisfactory because it will come to an end? You might add disappointment or anticipatory disappointment, anticipatory frustration or anxiety to it, but that's something we add. It's not inherently unsatisfactory. In the moment of experiencing it, it could be quite satisfying. In the present, 
It's not unsatisfactory. It just is what it is in the present. It is an enjoyable conversation with a friend. It is the sight of a beautiful flower or the resting in a lovely meditation. It's that meditation that we did together just 20 minutes ago. Was it unsatisfactory while you were experiencing it in the present? Since it is, like everything, of the nature to come to an end. So Buddha taught all phenomena that are subject to arising are also subject to passing away. Everything is. As a surgeon client of mine once told me, Rick, we have a saying in the OR, all bleeding stops eventually, one way or another. <laughs> okay, so these three, pain, the ending of what is enjoyable, and the inherent dynamism, instability of all phenomena. These are conditions. These are aspects of reality. Absolutely to be sure. Okay? Uh, I see a comment coming in at 7.06, and I'm really glad you brought that up, Evelyn, and I stay with it because um, it's how we think about suffering, and I'll talk about this in a moment. Absolutely, in the first kind of dukkha, we would have pain about people suffering. And let's remember, too, that this teaching from the Buddha did not arise in a privileged first world, you know, online meditation gathering led by an American white male who's had a lot of advantages. You know, the Buddha's teachings came out of a world in which there was no pain medication, in which there was slavery, patriarchy, um, medieval forms of power and privilege, uh, terrible stuff, wars, devastation, uh, and still, you know, these teachings arose. So let's, uh, you know, so I, I want to say I profoundly respect the question, Evelyn. Plus, I like your last name, too. It's six minutes past the hour, 7 p.m., 7.06 for me. Um, and I and I really want to um, invite you all to see for yourself, as the Buddha taught, what you find useful and relevant here and true. So these are conditions, right? There is pain. There is the ending of all phenomena, pleasurable and painful alike. And there's the inherent fizzing dynamism, lack of solidity of all phenomena. That's true. But they're not inherently suffering. So... I want to talk about the first one, which seems most obvious. Oh, pain would be suffering. Well, not necessarily, including the emotional pain of being aware, as, as I keenly am actually, of children who are hungry. So the Buddha made a really important distinction between the first and second dart of life. And others, people commenting, have made this point that the first dart of life includes physical and emotional pain. Absolutely. And we then may or may not add our emotional reactions to it. So I'm going to give you a minor example and a major one. Minor example, I don't particularly care for heat. I grew up in L.A. I moved north as fast as I could. Uh, my wife will be the first to tell you that I'm the person who turns on the air conditioner when other people are putting on sweaters. All right. And still, uh, especially... Uh, a couple of years ago when we were meeting in person, uh, there would be occasions in the summertime at where we met at D Dominican University in San Rafael, California, that it would be you know 98 degrees at 6 p.m. And in the room, probably about 100, 105. It's crowded with 80 people in it, even with the windows open. It was hot. And I had an experience one time in which it was I did not like the heat. The heat was for me an unpleasant experience, it, okay? But it did not bother me. That's a distinction. And as we strengthen our equanimity over time, our compassion can actually expand because we can be more and more open to the grief and the sorrow and the outrage in the world because in the core of our being, we are undisturbed. As the Buddha taught, we are not invaded by the pain and occupied by it. 
That's the key distinction between pain and suffering. Suffering invades and, and occupies and it possesses the mind. Pain is simply another experience passing through awareness or persisting, unfortunately, whose nature is that it is um, made of parts that are connected and changing. A more you know, um, significant uh, example was from a um, monk who told the story in Southeast Asia. This is someone who lives in great poverty, um, <coughs> vow, you know, vows of poverty, et cetera, in Southeast Asia, who needed to pull a tooth, had a terrible toothache. So this is a bit of a trigger warning. If you have anything going on about dentistry, especially in, you know, original conditions, not with all kinds of fancy pain control, which I'm the first to sign up for when I have to go to the dentist. Uh, so this, this, this monk pulled his own tooth and he was asked, how, how could you do that? And he said, well, um, when, you know, I took the decision to pull my tooth, there was no suffering. As I was walking, lifting, setting, lifting, setting my feet on the path to the tool shed where the pliers were, there was no suffering. As I opened the door to the tool shed, there was no suffering. There was simply opening the door, right? We're coming to the ground state of raw experience. Uh, there was hand reaching for pliers, no suffering. There was grasping the pliers, no suffering. There was placing the pliers on my tooth, no suffering. There was a sudden pull, there was pain. There was setting the pliers down, no suffering. There was turning around and walking out of the tool shed, no suffering. Whoa, <laughs> but you can see the distinction. There was pain, there was a toothache, uh, but there was not anguish about it. There was not recrimination. There was not being angry at others who let this happen. There was not anger at taking monastic vows that put him in a position where he did not have the means for dentistry. None of that. It was, there was nothing added. This goes to the famous sutta between the, the dialogue between the Buddha and a wandering um, practitioner of his time, Bahia, in which the Bahia pleaded with the Buddha for his teaching. And, it, and finally, the Buddha, who was busy, he was on his way elsewhere, just said very succinctly, you, should, you want my teaching, Bahia? Here's my teaching. You should train yourself thus. You should train your mind thus. In the seeing, let there be only the seeing. In the thinking, let there be only the thinking. In the sensing, only the, thing, the sensing. And when there is only the sensing and the sensing and the seeing and the seeing, there is no you there making up all kinds of reactions. And when there is no you there making up all kinds of reactions, whew, that, just that, is the end of all suffering. Boom. The heel was enlightened on the spot, supposedly. Um, so it's consistent with that teaching. We add our reactions to raw experience, which sometimes is painful, emotionally or physically. But that raw pain is not itself suffering in the sense of anguish or, or being upset about it or invaded and occupied by our reactions to that phenomena, okay? Second, if we can accept the ending, the second kind of dukkha, of all phenomena, Right? including the phenomenon of our own body and the phenomenon of the bodies of those we love. If we can accept the ending of that which is enjoyable, again, no suffering. And a lot of Buddhist, a practice, a lot of Buddhist practice is about developing um, the capacity to accept and allow and have insight into the endless ending of all phenomena. So we get less attached to them at the front end and we become more at ease when at the back end they pass away. They pass away. It was beautiful, right? It was like a beautiful show and it ended. Wonderful party came to an end. The day, you know, I was born, reality threw a big party for me, which included some crud, undoubtedly. All right, then there was another party. All right, I've had 
69 and a half plus days of parties, in a sense, of a kind, in a life that has actually had a fair amount of sadness and upset and pain and anguish and shame in it, inadequacy. And still, wow, and eventually the party will come to an end. There will be the last birthday party. Darn, the day before I pass away, um, or the day of I pass away. And oh, I'm probably going to want more parties. And you know, what a great ride. Thank you. you know, all waves disperse into the sea. And all along, their nature was water. Also, third kind of dukkha, if we can recognize what could be called the chronic trembling, <laughs> I love that translation, <laughs> trembling, not negative, just factually, trembling, the chronic trembling of all phenomena, and be at ease with that. And with meditative practice, particularly and over time, we, we have deepened in our insight and the granularity of our insight in time and space into the chronic trembling, the instability, the foamy, empty, ongoingness of all phenomena. If we can be at peace with it and not try to freeze it or contain it, then no suffering. It's not inherently unsatisfactory, right? All endings are matched by endless arisings and because the, and also the instability of phenomena allows painful, harmful conditions to change. And alongside these conditions, these are conditions of reality. There is much in the present as it appears in the mind that is neutral or enjoyable, right? Even as there is the condition of this ending, this is arising, it's nice. Or even as there is ending here and arising there in the mosaic of the mind, there is the grout of awareness, the stable, undisturbed, open, spacious capacity to keep representing experiences, right? So e dukkha is not the totality of everything. There's, there's a lot of good stuff happening, right? Even in a very challenged and burdensome life. Now, note here that they're a, a kind of world-denying, um, escapist um, impulse is woven into much early Buddhism. I'm not a scholar of those texts, but I have read a fair number of them. And my own sense of it is that the Buddha himself was much more straightforward. And actually what crept in after he passed away was this kind of world-renouncing, world-despising, world-disgusted you know, by teachings of later abbots to motivate pr people to practice. All right? And I just think, is that really true? Do we really need that? And you can see the correction coming in in Tibetan Buddhism and Zen, uh, the Mahayana that kind of has a more tantric attitude. There are phenomena, yes, phenomena are of the nature to include sometimes pain, and phenomena are of the nature to end, so the stuff we like ends. Well, stuff we don't like ends too, and new stuff we like can arise, and we can practice with it in ways that I'm gonna talk about right now. What makes dukkha suffering? What is it that makes dukkha suffering? What the Buddha taught is the second noble truth of tanha, which is routinely translated as craving. Not, not a bad translation. Uh, the root of the word for tanha is thirst. Think of it as thirst, right? Think of it as drive, pressure, clinging. That's what transforms dukkha into suffering in the Buddha's teaching and see for yourself what you think is true. So dukkha is just dukkha. Dukkha is not suffering. It's just dukkha. It is what it is. And we have these reactions to it. Very often grounded in a sense of something missing or something wrong, a deficit or a disturbance in the meeting of important needs that as biological creatures push us into tanha, which then lead to suffering. It's biologically normal to crave in a broad sense, to be in, or even in subtle ways, socially, to, to kind of crave that they, you know, 
they give you five stars for your book, or they crave that they smile at you more than they smile at them. Biology, evolution, right? Intensely shaped by evolution. Tanha drive states, intensely shaped by evolution. Neurological systems, often involving dopamine. We, you know, when we drop, when the dopamine rewards drop, like when the ending of, of something pleasurable occurs, uh, uh, it's a great way to keep, you know, monkeys and lizards and humans driving, driving, driving for those rewards, and it, which increases their odds of passing on genes that pass on genes. All right. Also. Distinct from other primates and mammals and vertebrates altogether, uh, the formation of the self, the, evolu the evolved construction of the apparent self also is involved with a lot of tanha, a lot of drivenness in human primates. Now, sometimes this biologically rooted in our physical being, baked into our DNA, sometimes tanha this drivenness is appropriate and necessary, even if suffering is the toll we pay for gathering our children and racing out of a burning building or fiercely resisting oppression or clinging as I have to a small hold because you don't want to fall while you're rock climbing. All right, sometimes there's tanha and we pay the price. But in general, much of our practice, the great majority of it is essentially how to get the benefits of tanha as motivated action without the costs of suffering. How to actually do that. For example, how do we learn to aspire without attachment? How can we love without clinging? See, we're engaged with life. This is the middle way the Buddha taught. It's not a um, world-denying escapist way, even if later teachers kind of spun it that way to motivate intensive practice. Um, we can open our hearts in compassion, which has some pain in it, because with compassion, we have empathy for the suffering of others alongside our caring response, our benevolence, our helpfulness in our response. We can open to that without it invading and occupying us in a way that is overwhelming or flooding or disabling. We can train in these ways, right? We can tolerate pain. There is pain. There is pain without adding tension to it or aversion or a lot of mental reactions or stiffening against it. We can hold our pain um, the, and, and the pain of others in a spaciousness of mindful awareness. We can face loss without fear. Loss is going to happen. We will lose everything and everyone we love at various times one way or another, including our own passing. Loss is inevitable. We can face that without fear. Doesn't mean we like it or prefer it, but we don't need to fear it or bring frustration uh, to it. Oh. You might want to reflect here. To me, it's incredibly hopeful. Dukkha is not suffering. There is dukkha. We don't have to suffer it. That was the liberating teaching. That is the liberating, freeing, good news of the Buddha. Dukkha does not equal suffering, which is full of hope, opportunity, and responsibility for us to practice. Reality is reality. Life is life. And we need not suffer it. Let that sink in. In effect, Buddhist practice is largely about how to have dukkha without tanha. How to meet these inherent conditions, these three inherent conditions of life amidst other conditions of living, of, of experiencing, how to meet these three conditions without being carried away by craving in our response to them. The Eightfold Path 
is very much about the trainings and the cultivation of wise view, wise intention, wise action, wise speech, wise livelihood, wise mindfulness, wise equanimity, wise concentration, wise effort rather. Um, we train in these things. This traditional trainings, wholly effective, um, already highly effective. And with modern science, with our modern scientific understanding of our biology, the underlying biological causes and conditions that seed our um, you know, construction of or, or our response of craving to the dukkha conditions of the world. Um, I think there are three big kind of new takeaways that, as you probably know in my own work, have been of particular interest to me. So building on, even enhancing, not replacing these entirely sufficient traditional ideas and methods. Still, see for yourself, one enhancement is to really focus on the internalization of whatever we are cultivating using methods from positive neuroplasticity that naturally tend to heighten the um, lasting changes of neural structure or function as we are uh, growing the good inside ourselves for our sake and other people. We can heighten the internalization. We can use neurologically informed methods to really help uh, wise view, wise intention, wise concentration, and so forth to really sink in and become increasingly stable within us. We can help these beneficial states become hardwired as beneficial traits through simple deliberate methods such as staying with these experiences for a breath or longer rather than changing the channel, such as feeling them in your body, such as focusing on what is enjoyable or meaningful about them. Any one of those three will heighten neuroplastic change repeatedly over time. Second, we can grow specific psychological strengths deliberately to meet challenges to our needs without being invaded by a sense of deficit or disturbance that is the biological basis of tanha. If we have sufficient capacity to deal with an interpersonal issue or to climb El Capitan or to um, you know, manage our own physical pain or illness as we age, if we have the strengths to meet challenges to our basic needs, we don't have to be disturbed by them. We don't have to be bothered by them as we cope. So growing psychological strengths in a very deliberate way to meet our needs effectively and systematically in ways that are not listed in the Eightfold Path. That's a modern innovation, I think, that's really important. Um, and then last, repeatedly internalize again and again and again the felt sense of your needs met enough in, in the present. Needs met enough already in the present, which evokes psychologically a sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love. And then what you do when you do that is you build up a, a core of unconditional, resilient well-being inside yourself. Trait fullness, trait balance that is increasingly impervious, undisturbable by tanha. Tanha is grounded biologically, craving is grounded biologically in an invasive sense of something missing, something wrong. If you hardwire into yourself increasingly a sense of fullness and balance, authentically, when it's true, in the meeting of your major needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection, then more and more, you know, dukkha bounces off in a sense. You can be with dukkha while rested in a felt sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love that truly has become increasingly embodied, woven into the fabric of your own nervous system. Oh. And then, if I may add something that's not necessarily grounded in our um, you know, scientific understanding, but it's really from my heart, it's to have compassion for the for the dukkha that others face. They may not have your practice. They're facing their own dukkha, their own pain, their own first darts. They're facing, you know, the dukkha of that which is precious coming to an end. They're facing the fundamental inherent 
um, quivering, instability of all phenomena. And it's hard for them, maybe. Without patronizing or condescending, we can have compassion for the meeting of others with dukkha. And we can do what we can to help them not suffer it, not necessarily suffer it. If I can close by quoting the Dalai Lama from Tricycle Magazine, um, he said, <clears throat> here, as soon as I wake up, I think about altruism. As soon as I wake up, I think about altruism, how to be helpful, compassionate, and helpful to other beings. Seems like a fitting ending here. You may have noticed that I've come to the end of my time. I usually have good time for questions and discussion. Tonight, I think it's enough to sit with us, to let it sink in. Dukkha does not have to be suffering. And the key add-on is tanha, is craving. It's drivenness, possessiveness, me, 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 me. All of that, that's what makes suffering happen. Suffering is not inherent in reality. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for paying attention throughout this. How about we just sit together for a minute or so, and I invite you to rest as I am in the radical possibility of living a full and real life with less and less suffering while being honest about the pervasiveness of dukkha in all three forms. You can rest in the possibility. Ah. For all beings, what a beautiful possibility for them too to live much, if not most of the time, eventually all of the time, without suffering. May this possibility be increasingly real in your life and the lives of all other beings. <clears throat>